good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to another session of the November to Remember series of the Creative uh, Technology Advancement Talk on Business Literacy and Employability Skills and Research Method. Uh, this series started yesterday and it was really, really interesting. Um, by the way, this series is organized by the School of Creative Technology, University of Bolton. And yesterday we had our first guest, um, the person of uh, uh, Jane Egerton, uh, the head of C's Facebook for Middle East and Africa. And of course, she talked about a lot of things which I believe we benefited from. So today is another day. So uh, I want us to send an invitation link to as many who have not gotten it because uh, we believe that today is gonna to be more than yesterday in terms of benefit because we know that we also have another resource person um, in the house. So today we have a uh, professor the house. Um, Professor Paul Hollins is in the house today. And today we'll be talking about computational research. So we believe, so we'll, we believe that it's gonna be uh, very interesting today. And uh, so, but we're, we're not letting him in already sometimes. So we are just want to quickly give you a background of what we are gonna be doing today. So, um, all we need to do today is that um, I'm not going to be doing this alone. So I have a colleague who's going to be assisting me, you know, in the moderation of today's um, event. And that's the person of um, uh, Gopritz Kao. So later on in, the, uh, in this uh, edition, you're going to see her. She read the profile of the guests that we have uh, today. So. Uh, by way of reminder, let me quickly uh, let us know that uh, because it's going to be very, very extensive and educative today, I'd like you to prepare your questions, okay? And you can actually send your question via the uh, chat. And of course, you can also wait at the end of the lecture to ask your question. What you need to do is just to signify by the raising, raising your hand on the icon at the bottom of the screen. And of course, uh, we'll call you in to ask your All questions. Right. And I believe that your questions will be treated. Okay, so uh, are we ready? Mm -hmm. uh, right now, I know that, okay, we have um, a lot of participants already coming in and we believe that will be more than the number that we had yesterday. Yesterday we had uh, about 60 or more persons online. So, um, and of course, we actually wanted to have a field asking questions and all that. So, so today is just another opportunity for us to um, get educated. So um, on the chat box, I want you to quickly, you know, just say, I just want to know that you are following. You could just tell us when you are, you know, uh, attending or watching this, um, 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 this event from whether I'm from um, Africa, whether from the UK or wherever you are. So I would really want us to quickly do that before we continue, you know? I just want to know that we are following, okay, okay. So quickly, just tell me where you are. Just write your name on the chat. Uh, box and say, all right, okay, we have um, uh, Sammy from the University of Bolton. Sam is already online. Of course, those that were around yesterday, I, I know that they will be in today because of how much knowledge that was impacted to us yesterday. And we believe that the knowledge is not going to end here because um, uh, what Skeletti did yesterday was trying to actually liaise with Jane so that we can have you know, that's reference in terms of employability. So we have um, Hafsa from the University of Bolton, is already around. Okay, Shera is also from Bolton, and we have Raham from Bolton also. 
and um, we have um, Shazai. Sorry about your name, please. Okay, uh, from Bolton, and quite a number of persons are just coming in. Okay, Zane from University of Bolton. All right, so we have a whole lot of persons who are joining us today, and that's interesting. So, um, <laughs> briefly. So I've had a question, I think I've talked about how we need to go about the question because it's going to be very, very interesting. So write your questions down. Of course, you can put it on the chat. It's more convenient for you or just wait to the end of the lecture and you raise your hand, ask your question and your question will be duly attended to. Okay. Um, all right, at this point, I want us to know that uh, this is not just all student affair. So on the platform uh, tonight, we already have um, a professor in the house. Um, we already have um, Professor Paul Collins in the house already. And of course, we have uh, the head of school of art and the acting head of school of creative technology, University of Putin. Uh, Sam Johnson is in the house also. And of course, I know that we have other, we, I know that we have other staff members of the University of Boston who are logged in. I may not be able to mention all your names. And of course, uh, we have Dr. Celestine Wendy in the house also, who is doing a lot of background work for this program. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to be inviting the um, head of school. Okay, I'm going to be writing the head of School of Arts and acting head of the School of Creative Technology, University of Putin for a brief talk. And that's a person of Sam Johnson. I wish we could have, we should have clap our hands together. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Oh, well, the whole back. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for that introduction. Oh, um, I think uh, I'll, I'll be I'll be incredibly brief. Um, I think you're right in saying that yesterday's talk um, was inspirational, and we learned a lot about how we can promote ourselves, both as staff and as students and as professionals, in the global job market um, through learning about self management, self. Uh, presentation, timekeeping, and so on. So it was very much employability focused yesterday's discussion. Uh, and as I say, I know I took a great deal away from, from that talk. Um, I know this evening um, will be just as interesting, perhaps even a bit more challenging. Um, I know Professor Paul, uh, we've worked together for many, many years, and I know you'll find his talk incredibly engaging, interesting, um, challenging, pushing against boundaries and making you think about experimentation and possibility in your own research and in your own studies. So um, again, it's lovely to see so many of you here. Uh, I think this series is a fantastic idea and uh, I'm so, so honored to be involved in it. So I'll hand it back to you host. All right, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Um, I would quickly want us to see, um, <clears throat> all right. Okay, I hope you can see my screen that the, um, the yeah. November to November series, the two program of events. And I hope you can see that on your screen. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, also we've done the welcoming address and of course the opening speech by Sam Johnson, the head of School of Arts and acting head of the School of Arts and Techn Creative Technology University of Bolton. And of course, I just in a bit, I'm going to be welcoming uh, my colleague, you know, uh, Gopreet Kao, who is going to be reading the profile of our resource person tonight. So after that, we are going to have a talk from Paul Collins, and uh, Paul, Paul Hollins, uh, pardon, and after which we'll be taking the question and the answer session, and of course, the presentation by the head of the school, and uh, again, we'll be calling on um, Dr. Celestine Wendy, who give us a closing remark, as well as the host of oh, thanks. So at this junction, I will want to hand over to my colleague who is standing by to actually read out the profile of the resource person that we have in the house today. Over to you, Gopreet.
well is my screen is visible to everyone yes yes it's visible so good evening everyone first of all i am really very excited to introduce our guest speaker for today uh, because his talk is really really uh, valuable for all of us so here is the brief background of professor paul hollins uh, he is a professor of cultural research development professor paul hollins is responsible for supporting collaborative research activities across the school of arts paul is an experienced academic and has published extensively across a diverse range of subjects in the arts education business and technology domain he is currently engaged by the university in the eu horizon 2020 project ray releasing on applied gaming ecosystem europe in chairing the witman 200 conference and in supporting the school of arts collaborative research projects so now i'm going to invite professor paul hollins and give him access to share his ppt and talk with all of us Hello there, uh, everybody. Let's just see if we uh, are functioning. Are we functioning? Can we see that screen? Oh yes. Yeah, we're okay. Are we? Is that okay? Yes. Can you you see me on the slides, everybody? A thumbs yes. up if we can. Yeah. Little yes. bit of help me with a bit of feedback. We're going to talk quite a bit about feedback and feedback loops today, and how important they are. within technology so um if i can see people it really helps if you don't want to be seen that's fine um but thumbs up and thumbs down where you don't necessarily agree are all welcome um thank you first of all to celestine sam gurpreet and awesome wengi and uh, forgive my pronunciation it's dreadful uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction um gurpreet the the introduction itself was slightly out of date i'm i'm not working on the rage project that was 5 years of my life which came to an end about 18 months ago uh, but it was a very interesting learning curve in itself uh first of all a, a little bit of background of me about me that isn't necessarily uh, perhaps what you know um i've not been an academic all my life for a number of years i was in the military and then after that i worked in software development and um, probably one of the most competitive digital industries uh, through the 1990s uh, and i became international licensing director for a major games publisher so um in terms of your careers and where you're going um very very happy to help and talk about um potential and the digital industries themselves um it was a large uk based uh, organization called midas and it was there that i really first became interested in the topic that i'm going to talk about with you today um i described myself a little bit as an accidental academic um and i think that's largely colored my approach to research and to acad academic disciplines throughout my career so as some said you're probably not going to get a most conventional talk here indeed you're not um a couple of things i'd i'd like to do unusually i'm going to start with acknowledgments usually they come at the end when we're all in a rush to finish and get home but actually there are a few people here that um oleg leba who was my professor that i studied under who was a massive inspiration to me and an influence and has hugely influenced my thinking and really introduced me to what I will talk about this evening professor stafford beer um stafford uh was a polymath a, a giant of a man uh massively influential 
with a very high intelligence. And a lot of what I'm going to say here is, is on the back of, of Stafford's work. It isn't original. I was taught by Oleg, who himself was taught by Stafford. And there's quite an interesting um, lineage of cybernetics that um, links back from me right through to the first name that I will mention uh, today during the talk, who is um, the eminent cybernetician Norbert Wiener. Uh, I've got a couple of caveats um, before we start. The talk that I was asked to deliver uh, is computational research. Well, I'm not sure that I'm going to talk a great deal about computational research. Um, I'm not going to be talking about it at all, in fact. Um, there'll be no lines of code. There will be no algorithms. And if you're attending this talk, and I'd rather it was a talk than a lecture, to talk about or to learn about analysis of algorithms, data structures, data trees, this one isn't really for you. Um, so maybe um, it, it's the wrong one. What I am going to talk about is I'm going to talk um, about not computational research. I think that's a better description. Um, my subversive intention of this talk is to perhaps introduce you to broader perspectives on research methods and tools that may actually lead you to challenged, more established and conventional, dare I say it in, in, in company, scientific quantitative approaches to research in technology. I'd go further and hope that I challenge you to think about subjects, their use and about disciplines and their place in research. As the REF, the dreaded research assessment framework that's foisted on universities every four or five years, moves to recognize impact, will this force our institutions to look at themselves and how research in the future, future will be conducted? I'm suggesting it will. Of course, quantitative methods unarguably have their place in computer science and as research methods with associated tools within school, many of you located in here at UOB in creative technologies. So we'll retitle this, not computational research, approaches to computing research. Another caveat, as I'm preparing the lecture, I'm very conscious that I'm gonna talk about a, a lot of very, very old and very, very dead white men, and not too many women or people of color. For that, I'm going to apologize, but I do this, and I do this openly in the hope that others, many of you of here, of different color and different gender, will take up the cybernetic baton, so to speak, and bring your own new cultural perspectives, both in the domain of cybernetic study and critique of the cybernetic tools themselves. Cybernetics, as you will learn, is about recognition of difference, about complexity, so do not be deterred. Cybernetics allows you to challenge many of the established scientific ways of thinking and gives you an excuse to do it. In this talk, I'll introduce you to perhaps a new way of thinking about technology and its place in society. Though in truth, there's nothing really new in or about cybernetics. I haven't long enough to talk to delve into the complexity, and that's a word that will reappear, reoccur many times in this conversation. But hopefully I'll provide some pointers for you to follow up, should you be interested. I'll introduce you to some cybernetic thinkers and to some tools that might just help you in thinking about researching in technology in these different ways and in, within your discipline. Um, although many of my colleagues would argue with real vigor that cybernetics isn't a discipline and that's the attraction. Um, so again, give that some thought. I'm gonna argue here that disciplines and subjects are where many of our challenges and issues around knowledge emanate from and why I believe so many of our technical interventions fail abjectly, miserably. 
The list of computers said no. Systemic failures are numerous. And why you as future technologists, computer scientists and creatives may often be viewed with fear, suspicion and doubts. Eyebrows may roll when you talk about your code, your new application and your products when you work in industry. The computer said what said no. Well, in fact, computers are never, ever wrong. Only people make mistakes in their coding, in their algorithm, in their development, in their input, in their analysis, interpretation, and in their actions. I think it's quite fitting today. I'm actually using Zoom, which I believe is very appropriate and a great exemplar of interaction. We could consider using analytical methods and tools that I'll talk about. I noticed in the flyer that Celestine uh, included the various letters and acronyms after my name. Did any of you note the last one of these and have any inclination of what that acronym is? Um, answers in the chat box and please let's have a couple of rub. The acronym was FCYBS. Anybody have any indication? Just put it in the chat box if you have. If it remains silent for 10 seconds, I'll go away. <laughs> there we are. Nobody has an inclination of what it is. It could be oh, anything. Oh, yeah. It could be my qualification in dustbin cleaning, my vacuum qualification. It could be anything. Nobody has a clue. So why am I here? I'm an, an, I'm an imposter. <laughs> um, Celestine, do you know what those letters stand for? Uh, actually, no. <laughs> actually, no. My head of school, Sam, do you know yes, what those I stand know, for? I know, but it would be cheating. I know, okay. know what it is, Paul. I know what it is. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoil the no. show. Okay. I, actually, I actually noticed it today. <laughs> yes, you noticed it. Well, for those that don't know, and that includes um 24 of the 25 participants in this lecture. Um, the acronym set stands for Fellow of the Cybernetic Society. Um, I feel a bit of an imposter yeah. in being awarded a fellowship, uh, but is, it is a great honour, and I really do stand on the shoulder of some very big giants. And as I said, that lineage of cybernetic cyberneticians, um, I'm at the end of it at the moment, and I'm hoping maybe one or two of you here will be the next ones on that line. Um, does anyone know what cybernetics is? That's my next question. And again, into the chat. Any definition? Don't I'm aware of psycho cybernetics. I'm not sure if it's the same. Sorry, you. Um, I yeah, came across an example when talking about. Um, character and how uh, it was an example of an airplane going in a particular direction and yeah. if it deviates it's going to return to its original position so if you are trying to reform your character you have to redraw a map for yourself so it's basically returning to the original path that you're meant to be on Something like that. That was the basic. You, are, you, are, you practically define cybernetics application, which is about feedback. Returning uh -huh. back to where you started from is the feedback system. Okay. Well, we, we, we're delving in there. Um, I, I could give a lecture now, which is one of my favorites, on the paradox of rationality in cybernetics. But I think I'd lose all 25 of you if I did. Um, but there's a wonderful book by Nigel Howard, um, on the paradox of rationality, which talks about aircraft and aircraft plans and mapping and leads us into game theory, which is a subset of cybernetics, which again is an interesting letter. But suffice this to say that defining cybernetics is actually complex in itself. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about um, cybernetics and, and we'll give you some definitions so that you have an idea. I think probably the best way of perhaps indicating you the uh, complexity of cybernetics, that word again, which will reappear, was um, a story that Stafford um, once um, told me um, in, in, in a lecture that I was in. And it was a story about um, a uh, 
three people on death row, uh, one lady and um, two men. Uh, one of the men was a, 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 a staunch Catholic. Uh, the lady was a professor of cybernetics and the other person was a student of that process, uh, professor, three people on death row. And before they're taken to uh, their execution in the US, they're granted a wish. And the first person um, is the very staunch Catholic and granted the wish, his response is, well, I'd love to meet the Pope and confess all my sins. And that's really what I want to do before I meet my maker. The second um, person on death row, uh, she is a professor of cybernetics. And the um, uh, executioner asks this professor of cybernetics, what do you want to do before you're executed? And she says, I'm going to write the definitive and absolute unquestionable answer in a paper to define cybernetics. And um, the executioner said, yes, I, I think we can manage that. And then the third person is a student of that professor. And the executioner asked that student um, of the professor, what is your wish um, before we execute you? And his response was to be executed after her. Now, that's a rather, maybe the humor's lost, but it's quite interesting that Getting that definition of, of cybernetics is, is really um, very, very difficult. Mm. Um, okay. So, Stefan, uh, Wikipedia provides us with a, a definition, and I, I'm going to read it to you. I, I've got my note here. Cybernetics is a transdisciplinary, antidisciplinary approach concerned with regulatory and purposive systems their structures, constraints, and possibilities. The core concept of the discipline is circular causality or feedback. That is where the outcome of actions are taken as inputs for future action. So as Celestine said, um, whoever answered about um, feedback has, has pretty much got cybernetics. Um, other definitions are the study of controls of any system by using technology, but I'm not really happy with either of those, or indeed any of the definitions from the first um, founder of, of cybernetics. He defined um, cybernetics as the study of control and communication in animal and the machine. But my own particular favorites are probably um, one, the first one is the science of defensible metaphors which I, I think is a wonderful explanation of what cybernetics is, um, or the science of everything, uh, which doesn't really help us today, but, but they're both good definitions. A really useful distinction to make is that many of the conventional scientists uh, and sciences are interested in the representational, that is depicting object or phenomena in a recognizable manner. Yeah. Cybernetics isn't really interested in that. What it's interested in is the performative, how things behave. Systems thinking itself has now been appropriated within science, but cybernetics thinks of things as systems of some kind. And I know that's a little bit confusing. So we went through what we're going to talk about today, but I'll give you a brief history of cybernetics. Um, the term cybernetics actually comes from uh, the Greek, which is Kubernetes, uh, which means steersman or governor. So hence, we've got a nice classical Greek painting there with a steersman. Um, it was first used by Plato um, in Alcibiades to signify governance of people. Mm. We think this because the authenticity of the text has been argued for many years, but we think that's where it first appeared. It's also in Homer, in Greek mythology. Steer to the light. Well, how do you do it? Um, and then the word Kubernetes into Latin translates to governor. 
So governance comes into this. Um, if I asked you to steer to a light and you were crossing a lake, how would you do it? It's a very complex process. Well, actually, it isn't. You look at the light and you head in that direction. Uh, and that's what we're trying to perhaps touch on in cybernetics. Um, to explain that through other sciences would be really, really difficult. Just look at the light and follow it. And that's what the steersman did. The term re-emerged in the 1830s from the French physicist Ampère to describe government. Again, that word governance before being popularized by mathematician Norbert Wiener in his work in the mid 20th century. Norbert, uh, Norbert's widely regarded as the founding father of cybernetics. He started in 1943 and he was an extraordinary person and character. All cyberneticians seem to have a common thread of being a little bit bonkers. Um, and, and it's a consistent theme. During the Second World War, he was tasked by MIT with doing something about anti-aircraft fire. How do you train anti-aircraft systems and guns to hit their targets? How do you track an aircraft? Um, it's predictive. Um, it isn't easy. Norbert was a mathematician. And when he was at MIT, he met a me Mexican um, scientist called Artero Rosenblum, who was a neurophysiologist. And they both became obsessed with what each other was doing in terms of their approaches and their disciplines. They knew nothing about them. And they proceeded to send six months with each other, learning about each other and the way they thought. And that cross disciplinarity is, is crucial to cybernetics. And I would argue that that meeting cybernetics was born. They met with um, a chap called Warren McCulloch. Um, he would describe himself as a blacksmith, but he was actually a physician who um, uh, actually coincidentally lived next door to Einstein, but that's one of those things. He established a telelogical machine. Um, does anyone know what about telelogic? No, okay. Well, telelogic is a machine with a purpose. Now, there's something new, machines that actually do something. Um, and he developed a, a series of conferences around telelogics. Um, but he was also a very accomplished poet uh, and would deliver lectures through his poetry, which was very, very challenging for some of his students. Um, and we describe these pioneering cyberneticians as brilliant, but very eccentric. Warren and Norbert were to become friends, but like so many, they fell out in later life. But that was the spark that ignited cybernetics, uh, enough that a major foundation, Macy, funded a series of conferences from 1946 to 1953. Um, these conferences brought together a diverse interdisciplinary community of scholars and researchers who would join forces to lay the groundwork for a new science. These conferences, known as the Macy Conferences, constituted a landmark of the field. They were to develop and grapple with new terms, such as information and feedback, that would become equally applicable to living beings and machines, economic and cognitive processes, and many scholarly disciplines. The concepts that emerged from these conferences came to permeate thinking in many fields, biology, neurology, sociology, ecology, economics, politics, psychoanalysis, linguistics, computer science, anthropology, mathematics, physiology. These lectures were interdisciplinary and ideas emerged from groups chatting with each other, learning about other disciplines. And they were, got them together for about 20 of them every year. And the commonality exposed, exposed during these lectures was one of something con, con, called control. Mm -hmm. Now, um, cybernetics, control is a very, very important part of that. Now, not control, it's a very, very contentious term. Mm -hmm. so, so bear with me about what constitutes control. Um, it isn't some top-down instruction. But it's, it's the way, it's the mechanisms, it's the way that, that systems work with each other. And hence, um, cybernetics 
science of control and communication in the animal and the machine. It took him years to understand what cybernetics is. Um, it was multidisciplinary. Um, the only consistency found in the Mercy lectures, and I've read all of them, is that of control. Um, and they lasted for 10 years. Um, and then Wayne McCulloch, who we talked about, said, well, the one thing is never do anything without knowing the results of your last action. Okay. Now, um, our first woman, before we talk uh, about Ashby, uh, there was a, one woman at the Macy Lectures called Margaret Mead. You may not have heard of her. Anyone heard of Margaret Mead or know her work? Now, Margaret was a very eminent anthropologist, and, and she's probably in the UK, not in America, most famous for. She was tasked by Roosevelt um, to study the behavior of US um, army personnel in the UK during the Second World War. There was a huge problem. Um, also, Churchill thought of US soldiers chatting up um, English women. And um, there was a problem with pregnancies. And Margaret Mead was asked to come and have a look at this from an anthropological perspective as to why it was occurring. And a long story short, but it boiled down to communication in that uh, American culture demanded that if you asked a lady to go to bed with you, quote, unquote, it meant what it meant. If you asked a lady to go to bed with you in UK culture during the Second World War, it was thought of as a proposal of marriage. Now, there is an obvious cultural interpretation there. And, and that was the problem that Mead had discovered. It was one of what was meant and how that was interpreted. Um, and so Margaret was brought in to give an anthropological perspective, which was very, very valuable um, in, in systems thinking. Now I'm gonna talk about a guy who was there called Russ, Ross Ashby. And Ross Ashby, um, I won't dwell on this, but um, he was a very complex character who um, um, was a psychiatrist who ran a hospital and uh, Ross had the task that he set himself um, to um, actually construct a synthetic brain. Um, so um, Ross Ashby was a British cybernetician working in the 1950s who became interested in the construction of this brain, a brain in a, a, of a notion called homeostasis the way in which co complex systems change environments, succeed in maintaining variables. Um, so the brain manages a very complex system, which is the human body within tightly defined limits. And Ashby came up with a concept of variety as a measurement of the number of possible states of a system. And he um, emerged with something called the law of requisite variety, which I'll, I'll come back to. I, I can dwell on this, and I'm already way over time, so I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it, but how can you manage variety? Well, there's actually only one way to manage variety, and that is with variety. And so Ashby thought a lot about the science and art of understanding. Um, and so those were the, the seeds of, of early cybernetics. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit in the next section because I want to bring it to the UK. Everything I've talked about there was US based. Now, um, the Ratio Club um, was what I, a, a group of all white English men. Uh, sadly, I, I, I can't challenge that. Um, that was a, effectively a drinking club. Um, the Ratio Club was a, young, a, a group of young academics who came together to discuss this thing called cybernetics. Um, founded in 1949 by neurologist John Bates, um, who studied nervous design, diseases. The club gathered in basement rooms and over a beer and food, participants would listen to speakers 
and then talk about them. The other members were a combination, again, interdisciplinary, neurobiologists, engineers, mathematicians, physicists, um, and one famous guy who's right in the middle of that, who you may have heard of, called Alan Turing. Um, again, we could talk about Turing and his work um, for an hour, but, but I'll, I'll park that one there. A very, very intelligent man who decoded, uh, with the help of others, um, the enigma uh, during the Second World War. The club was noteworthy because many of its members went on to become really prominent scientists. Barlow was there, who was the great grand grandson, who's the guy on the right there of Charles Darwin. Uh, Thomas Gold, John Pringle, a whole host of them came on to do um, many great things. I'm going to talk about one in particular who you might not have heard of, called Walter Gray. Now, there's Walter. Um, Walter was interested in electron cephalography, um, and that is study of the brain and, and brain responses. And um, he was a world leader in that. When he wasn't researching this, he used to sit in his shed. And when Walter was in his shed, um, he would play with little bits of electronics. And Walter went on to develop what was the world's first autonomous mobile robot. Um, there were two. Uh, one was called Elmer and one was called Elsie. And he used to study about brain function and he demonstrated that robots at the rate, well, that robots could in, in effect act in a very, very similar way to the human brain. He demonstrated the Ratio Club in 1950 and exhibited at the Festival of Britain in 1951. And this was a pivotal moment in the development of future disciplines around robotics and artificial intelligence, which have great, great currency now. Um, there's a lovely story about robots and legs and how robots are only attracted to women, but I'll park that. Um, and if we've got time at the end in the questions, perhaps we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, that's Elsie um, and Elsie responded to light. And so she moved towards um, light um, in an autonomous fashion. Uh, in effect, that is the world's first robot. Built in Walter's shed, uh, the US Department of Defense was spending millions and millions of dollars on research into robotics, and Walter managed to build one in his shed. Um, so there it is, that's the world's first, first robot. Um, I won't talk about Turing, we'll cover him. Many of you may be familiar with Turing's work. Um, and it all kind of fell apart in around 1955. It had run its course, um, but cybernetics was, was clearly on the map. And then we got what I would call a, a, a second phase of cyberneticians. And again, I'm not gonna dwell on this too much in this talk because this is probably more suited to my educational college colleagues, but Gordon Pask um, was the uh, uh, developer of a theory called conversation theory. Um, and the idea of conversation theory is that all learning occurs through conversation about a subject matter. And we all bring something to that. It was the very, very early days of constructivism, but Pask quite often in the midst of time seems to have been forgotten about, but he used a cybernetic frame to think about communication and how we make knowledge explicit. Um, his brother was a, a cybernetician, a very interesting character called Edgar Pask, who was decided to um, test uh, life belts, and he developed a, a life belt uh, through attempting to drown himself, drowning himself in swimming pools. But that's another story. They're all a little bit mad. And then we'll get on to probably the person that um, I want to talk about most in this lecture, uh, and that is Professor Stafford Beer. Um, Stafford, as he looks, was a professorial um, character. Um, and again, um, I learned an awful lot 
from Stafford's thinking and just about everything I'll talk about here is based on that. Um, he escaped in his own words from school in 1943 um, because it wouldn't let him do what he wanted to do. Subjects, um, he wanted to study Greek, he wanted to study French, neither of which he was allowed to do until somebody decided that studying French during the war would be a good thing, dropping parachutists into France in, um, believe it or not, in nun outfits. It's a true story. Um, and Stafford went on to be very prominent in operational research in the early 1950s. Um, though he worked in industry and he was head of organizational research in Sheffield um, for what would later become British Steel. And he started applying cybernetic theories in British Steel as early as the 1950s. Some people think it's another word for automation, some that it concerns experiments with rats, some that it's a branch of mathematics, others it wants to build a computer capable of running a country. My hope is that people will understand both how these wonderfully different notions can be simultaneously current and also why none of them is to the point. Um, so that's, again, Stafford. The computer says no. Variety management. How do you manage it? We go back to that. How do you regulate variety? And what Stafford worked on was a couple of notions. You uh, attenuate, which is you reduce variety or you amplify i.e. you increase variety. And when I talk about his later work in vital systems models, you'll see how that fits in. Um, unfortunately, in society, we use a lot of computing to attenuate, to do what we've done before, but more elaborately. Um, is that helpful? I'll leave you to question that. Um, a model, and he built lots of models or accounts of systems um, that need regulation. Now, you can't regulate, he would argue, any model, uh, any system, any organization without a model. Uh, and that's the viable systems model. Now, again, time is, is of the essence here. But what he did was he thought of five levels within all organizations. And those levels are there on that diagram. It's a bit of a scratchy one I took from a book earlier. But um, system one management, that is what you do as an organization, the doing. Now, the arrows there are very much like an electrical system. And as Celestine indicated earlier, those are feedback loops from the environment and from the system. The system one feeds into um, the controlling, uh, the coordination system, which is kind of your junior management um, in an organization. Um, system two, feeds into system three, which is the controlling mechanism. So that's, that's how your rules and regulations and within your organization um, work. That feeds into a system four, which is planning. So, you know, how do you, how do you think about what it is you're going to do? And then system five is policy or strategy, as we would perhaps call it now. Now, the thing about the VSM is that it thinks about all organizations as being systems, all things as being systems. So it would argue that each of those systems needs to be autonomous for the whole system to work through levels of recursion. And that's a term that in cybernetics we use quite regularly. So one system has to be, and Beer's word is viable, and all systems have to be viable for an organization to be viable. Now, if you start thinking about organization systems or even software in those ways, what we build up is a very, very complex picture of organization and understanding of organization. And that's, in essence, what the VSM is. And you can apply that to any organization. Um, I've worked in several projects where we've looked at and um, applied that system to education itself and how education systems work. Um, again, that's the viable systems model. 
Now, Stafford went on um, and probably the ultimate expression of the viable system was a project called Project Cybersim. Now, there's one of the original drawings and, and those are actual, uh, th th that's a photograph on the left of the room and the right. Um, Project Cybersim ran in Chile under uh, President Allende, which was a Marxist government from 1971 to 73. And what Stafford did, and those that are interested in data, this is really, really important, was what we call now perhaps big data. All data was fed in from all industries which were nationalized through telex machines into this very space age looking room where policy and strategy were enacted. One of the problems with government was, um, or Beer described as lag. Our data, our information in government in the 70s had a horrible lag. So decisions you were making were made on data that was eight months, 12 months old. And to some extent, we still suffer from that, from lag. Organizations such as government make decisions on things that have happened 12 months ago. So what Stafford tried to do with Project Cybersim was speed up those feedback processes. And um, so Project Cybersim modeled all industry into that viable systems model that I talked about to you earlier. Um, again, I'm happy to talk to people in more detail about Cybersim and how that worked. Um, but it was the first occasion that a scientific theoretical model had been used to run a country. Question I always get asked is, well, why did it stop? Um, well, it stopped in 1973 when a very likable chap called General Pinochet, uh, funded by the CIA, decided that he didn't like Marxism and neither did the USA. And so it very quickly came, came to an end. Allende, unfortunately, um, killed himself before he was captured. Um, Fernando Flores, the Chilean architect who worked with beer on Cybersim, was put in prison and um, Stafford came back to lick his wounds in the UK. Um, but he didn't stop there. He worked with a, um, a very, at that time, very unknown musician called Brian Eno. And Brian was involved in electronic music with another hat on. I would talk about Brian Eno and electronic music and how cybernetics influenced music. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that today. That's for perhaps another talk in creative arts uh, in some other location. Now, um, I'm going to talk practically uh, about something I did uh, a few years ago. Um, that's a very blurred image of, of my pond at home, which I, I took in, in the summer. It's a very nice pond. Um, why do I have a pond there? Well, I talked about Gordon Pask and I talked about Stafford Beer and their experimental work in the 1960s was about um, something called biological computing. Now, uh, again, we haven't got time to talk about biological computing, but in essence, it was looking at the way that nature's systems computes and controls. Now I used, I, I, I gave a talk and it was to the Institute of Directors, and the title of the talk was um, A Pond Could Run Your Business Much Better Than You Do, um, which was a really controversial talk, um, but I was asked to stir them up, so I did, and I talked about how a pond was better than they were. Now, um, I talked about um, Stafford Beer, Stafford's work and Pask's work in trying to link up systems of nature um, with decision-making, which they attempted to do in the 60s, did it theory, ther theoreti theor theoretically, never managed to do it. And I'm always waiting for one of the directors to put his hands up, who's looking there with a very stern face to say, this is rubbish, this is academic gone mad, and, and you know, did it work to try and catch me out? But I'm ready for that question. I say, no, it didn't work. But just park that question for the moment. What Stafford and, and Gordon and, and, and my presentation was about was that a pond is an ecosystem. If you throw oil into a pond, it will self-regulate, it will adjust, it will um, 
For a short period of time, some of the flora and fauna may die off, but in time it will self-regulate. Now, who controls it? Who tells it to regulate? Who tells the flowers not to grow and then to grow again? How is that all managed? Well, it, it just happens. Well, it doesn't just happen. Each of those elements within a biological ecosystem are viable in themselves. And that links back to the viable systems model. So that was the purpose of my talk. Uh, and then they kind of come round to it. And then I come back to that question about all oh, this fanciful idea of biological computing. And, and I talk and say, well, we'll go back to biological computing. Now, given that stupid idea that Beer and Pascad in 1960 about biological computing and linking man-made systems to ecosystems, um, would it surprise any of you in this audience to learn that the flight paths of drone attacks in Iraq, which was at the time I was talking, are controlled by nanoparticles of rats' brains. Uh, it's happening, it's real. And in terms of biological computing, it's gone down an avenue which is quite scary and quite worrying, um, but it isn't fanciful. It's here and Beer and Pask's work has been carried on, particularly um, by the US Department of Defense and it's being used today. Um, so those fanciful ideas of those mad cyberneticians are being used. I think to summarize um, Stafford's uh, thinking, um, his big criticism is in science, we, we reduce things, it's reductionism, we take them apart. But is that always the best way of approaching things? If you take a radio apart, and it's playing Ariane, Ariana Grande. Does it explain why we like Ariana, Ariana Grande or whatever her name is, showing my age there? No, it doesn't. We can learn about the components, but it's only when they function together and that interaction with a human being occurs, that feedback loop, that we learn something very, very useful. Um, losing the results of those interactions, the performative aspects of, uh, of, of uh, relationships is critical to cybernetics and it allows you to think about that. Now, as a scientist and a future developer, perhaps start thinking about this other way of looking at the world outside of your code. As I said, radios, engines, you take an engine apart. Does it tell you or give you a feeling of going and driving very, very fast in a car. No, it doesn't. So uh, it's really a bit of a call to arms now. Um, I'm going to, well, cybernetic thinking. Um, I, I could talk a lot, a lot about great cybernetic thinkers like Maturana and Varela in the 1960s, who um, talk about power and control systems, and that, that that's worth doing. But I think if Stafford alive today, I think he'd be working on climate change and he would have much to offer us in terms of challenges we as society face. And recent cybernetic conferences have looked at this and focused on the monumental challenges we face. But as recently indicated, words aren't enough to prevent, in Beer's terms, catastrophic failures. Um, so it's time for a renaissance. It's time to start using these kind of approaches and tools again. Um, and as Beer said, these are extremely complex systems and we've got methods and tools by which we can look at them. The Society of Cybernetics has um, quadrupled its membership in the last 18 months. Um, cybernetics was used and listened to by government in terms of modeling the impact of COVID. Um, their action, perhaps leave something to be desired, um, but they did look at using these models. So I'm gonna ask you really, and pose a question here, does cybernetics fit in your world? Does it fit in your research? Does it offer you any other approaches outside the established quantitative and qualitative research methodologies that you learn of in other oh, languages? Yeah. And on that note, um, I've kept it short. 
I've not talked about half the things that I really wanted to talk about. Um, I could go on for another two hours, but I will stop. Okay. I, I think that uh, we want, really want to appreciate uh, Let's appreciate uh, for Hollins. We, I mean, you talk so much about a lot, and uh, I feel this is still like an introduction because I know this is a very wide little topic. Uh, but basically, we learned a little uh, history about cybernetics, of course, cybernetic thinking, uh, biological computing. But at this time, I would like us to ask questions. If we have questions, please just raise your hand. So we could ask questions. Um, okay. we, we, have, we have some questions in the chat that I, I could happily run through very briefly before we start, if we can. Um, we've got a lovely definition there from Kalihi. Uh, excuse my pronunciation, but cybernetic science of communication and automatic control system in both machines and living things, yeah? Um, Inigo Alvarez, I think that if it went into living things, it would be bionics, a different thing. No, um, I disagree with you there, that bionics is a subset of cybernetics. Um, but that's a debate we could probably have. Um, no, I learned here that actually it goes much deeper than I was expecting, which I'm quite surprised. It was a shock to me. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we've maybe answered that one. Um, I love Brian Eno's music. Music for airports is my favourite. Amir, I'm with you. I love music for airports. Yeah, now, um, I'm, I'll happily dominate and talk about Brian Eno and his use of cybernetics, but I can see Sam giving me that daggered look as head of department saying, computers, computers, technology and research. Um, but, but yes, Eno... Eno was given a book on cybernetics by his mother-in-law when he was at Newcastle University, which was a very uh, prominent cybernetics department. And uh, it underpinned much of what he did in Roxy Music and certainly the development of Ambient, which you talk about there, um, and was critical to that. Sadly, he kind of moved away from cybernetics um, later in his career and uh, obviously decided to take a very bad career step and and produce you too. Um, but um, that's Brian Eno. And I happily talk about that. Any other questions, Osawengi? Yes. Yeah, there's a question from uh, Oyinka Shola. So please unmute your mic and ask okay. a question. Um, hello, Paul. Thank you. Very interesting topic. Um, I was going to ask is there a way to integrate um, cybernetics into pro um, personal and professional development in schools? Yeah, um, that's a really, really interesting question. Um, before, um, it, within Bolton, um, for many years, we used to have a, um, an institute of educational cybernetics. And most of our work was looking at how we might apply um, cybernetic lenses to educational challenges. So um, we've actually published quite a bit. Um, I can dig that. What it, who was I speaking? I can't see them, so it's quite difficult. Um, let me see. That's that... me. Ah, oh, okay. Ah, hello. It's lovely to lovely to see a face. Um, so so yes. Um, please, if you'd like to email me at the end, I'll I'll, I'll point you in a lot of directions. But what we looked at was the education system itself, and this particularly th this fixation that education has with subject and discipline. And, and what we thought, uh, and certainly greater cyberneticians than myself, um, thought, well, is this synthetic? Is, is it real that, that um, we should manage these things in, 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 in such discipline-specific ways? And, and we came to the conclusion that it's not, that it's actually, it can be really, really unhelpful. And if you're going to try and address big issues like education, then perhaps we should start thinking a lot more holistically and perhaps look at more 
um, unconventional approaches to education. And we were exploring those kind of things. But in terms of thinking about your own personal development, um, as I said in the lecture, I think that we are all viable systems ourselves. And if we think of ourselves as a viable system, and it isn't mechanical, it isn't computational to think that way, but think of yourself as a viable system and that you are subject to these feedback loops, positive feedback and negative. And negative feedback isn't necessarily bad. Then you could start thinking about building personal portfolios around those kind of models. Um, I've not done it but I think it would be a very, very interesting approach. Think of yourself as a viable entity. Um, and, and when we talk about education and where cybernetics could help in that, and increasingly in society, I mean, even within the university, we're thinking about well-being. Then well-being isn't necessarily on your curriculum or within your module or your course study, um, but it's an integral part of what, you know, we as a university have to think about, and you have to think about. Now, if you model that cybernetically, then we might get something interesting. What works towards your well-being as a student as you go through your course of studies and whatever it would be. So I haven't done it, but I think it's got interesting potential. D does that answer your question? Yes, it does. It does, because um, I know that we tend to, events that happen tend to shape our path to a certain extent. So if you, given an example of saying you want to draw a three month vision board and you have a target, um, I, would, I was thinking of a way to apply cy um, cybernetics to be able to map yourself in the right direction without deviation. And even when you deviate, you're able to get back on track to achieve your um, purpose. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, well, again, a good example of that is that and we'll use that word again, but in the academic university context, when you get feedback from your lecturer uh, and your course of study, well, you know, if that feedback will be because we've got brilliant lecturers in Bolton, as you know, will be constructive. And even if there are negative elements in there, they will be expressed in a positive way so that in terms of your own personal development, perhaps it will give you things to work on and to develop, but, but model it and think of it as constructive. Um, and just think of yourself as a viable system. Um, and it's a great way of modeling this thing. So maybe you got 40 on one of your assignment modules. Well, what's that negative feedback going to do on my next module? Well, I can construct something in a different way. So it's really interesting you've raised it. I'd never thought of doing it at a personal level, but applying it, as I mentioned in the lecture, in a recursive sense, you should be able to do it, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for the question. and. Uh... Thank you for the answers too. I don't know if there are other questions. Uh, I, I can't see any hands up, but what I would say is that um, if you have more questions, um, like Paul Hollins already said, you can actually email him. And of course, he'll be available to answer questions. If you have more questions, please just try and email him or get you to uh, um, Dr. Celestine. I'm sure that he will be able to guide you also. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so at this juncture, I'm going to uh, invite back um, the head of school for our presentation. So uh, yeah, so I'm going to be inviting her back. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say a few words and then and then present something. Um, I'm sure we're all very, very appreciative of, of Paul sharing his expertise there so, so generously. And I think perhaps what we could take away from this particular talk is the way in which sometimes, I know when we're undertaking research, we're focusing upon our project, we become more and more short-sighted and myopic in terms of what we're looking at. But I think if we look back to the history you know, of the riot club, of, of these amazing minds 
if you like, the, the, the great, the, the originality, the unique thought, the innovation has come from people at looking outwardly, taking a holistic approach, learning from other disciplines and other areas of expertise, rather than becoming more and more narrow in one's focus. I think it's a, it's a remarkable thing to see, isn't it, that you can have psychiatrists, physicists, mathematicians, anthropologists working together to create new thought, new ways of doing things. Um, and what's even more amazing is that plants are doing it before us, have been for many, many, many eons. You know what I mean? What could, what, what have we yet to learn from, from the natural world? It's absolutely remarkable. So I'm sure we're all very, very appreciative of Paul sharing thoughts there, and it hopefully will provoke um, some, as I say, experimental thinking in your own projects as you move forward um, and look for the unexpected, you know, and, and if you trip upon things that you think, well, how does that relate to my, um, relate to my research interests, then it's often the unexplained and the unexpected that can open all kinds of new opportunities and new doors. So just be open to that. I think that that's what I'll take away from this. Um, so thank you very much, Paul. Now, what I'm going to do now is um, I'm just going to, uh, if you wait one second, I'm going to be... Um, uh, here we go. I'm going to share my, I'm going to put this on here. Hang on. This is me being technologically inept. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, if people can see that, there we have it. Uh, I'm going to award Professor Paul Holland, if you can see that on your screen, um, this, this fantastic award uh, from all of us who participated this evening. Uh, thank you for, your, for, for a, a, a stimulating and challenging talk, and you would be stimulating and challenging, and we'd like to express our gratitude for gracing the occasion. So thank you very much, Paul. That was absolutely fantastic. And perhaps we could have a round of applause, everybody. If that's okay, let's take our mutes off. <laughs> thank you ever so much. And then I'm gonna hand back to Celestine. Friends, what a fantastic approach to cybernetics. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Paul Hollings for coming to grace this occasion. And I know everyone has one way or the other, you know, been enlightened in cybernetics. Remember, this is just an introduction to cybernetics. We are going to have him next other time in this same topic. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, uh, the head of school, Sam uh, Johnson, for your, uh, the way you have accepted this program and then the way you, you know, it's, it's actually very great. It's actually very great. We have so much in stock. Remember next week, we're having two other great speakers, Monday, uh, 6 p.m. UK time, and Tuesday, 6 p.m. UK time also in research, employability, business innovation, and creativity. It's going to be awesome. Stay tuned again next week. Thank you all for coming, and good night. <laughs>